as uh, as promised a few weeks back um, I'm sure a lot of uh, uh, mainline churches are surely remembering the great work of Martin Luther and uh, the great protest Protestant Reformation uh, and it, it is 500 years uh, from 1517 till 2017 and October the 20 October the 31st is uh, when uh, this whole Protestant Reformation took place <coughs> so we, we will look at that first principle um, of the five principles uh, that uh, the Protestant Reformation uh, came about uh, showing it to this world that these are the basics that we are supposed to follow <coughs> and uh, those are just amazing so we'll look at that first one but before that there is a two minute 19 second uh, um, um, a trailer of uh, a documentary on the life of uh, Martin Luther if if we are able to get the full movie during this month we will plan to screen it on one Saturday evening but this will just give you a glimpse of um, how uh, Martin Luther actually um, revolted against um, the Catholic faith and what he had to face and and, and I'll share <coughs> now the four different ages of of uh, the Christian Church as as a small PPT uh, just to um, give you a, a broad idea of where we are today uh, from the time Jesus uh, established the church through those 11 disciples after Judas Iscariot hanged himself there were only 11 of them and Jesus took 40 days appeared 11 times 11 times and uh, <coughs> poured out his heart in their lives and they were filled by the Holy Spirit and that's how the church started so we'll quickly look at that and with a very limited time we'll go through the first message uh, but before that we will see the small clipping <coughs> of Martin Luther That was one of his favorite statements. I did nothing. The world did everything. Amazing. Um, I'll, I'll share a small presentation about uh, um, 
the stage is how the church evolved uh, broadly four stages or the ages of the church and <clears throat> this is just a summary and we'll quickly get into the message the, the first age is called the apostolic church age which is AD 30 to AD 100 after Jesus rose from the dead and <clears throat> and when he established uh, his disciples and uh, after the day of Pentecost we know and till the death of John the Beloved that is the apostolic church age after that this the next part another another 200 years is called the persecuted church age that is AD 100 to AD 313 from the death of Apostle John to the conversion of Roman Emperor Constantine to Christi Christianity and in that period um, the church and and when I say church all those who believed in Lord Jesus Christ and were following in that way went through severe persecution if you uh, read those martyrs lives uh, I mean it, it's it's just uh, it's just amazing uh, for the kind of um, uh, faith that they had uh, at the as they testified about uh, what they were following and <coughs> uh, after this you have the, the third phase which is called the Imperial Church Age which is from 1313 to AD 476 which is closely about 150 years and and during this time the, there was <coughs> uh, certain changes that the church went through but the most sad part is after this close to thousand years which is called the medieval church age from 476 AD to 1517 the church became complacent over thousand years lot of pagan cultures came into the Christian church and and then in 1517 that is when the reformation happened which is through Martin Luther and it is 500 years from now and this this is what it is while while he opposed a lot of things and with due respect to uh, all those who come from Catholic faith and even as of now uh, Catholic faith is huge uh, and it is our prayer that uh, we not only want to say that we love our Catholic brothers and sisters but then it is our prayer that they come to know that which is true and adapt that faith that is pure and just and which is according to the Holy Scripture so it is it is our prayer as we go through this five Sundays that people realize why Martin Luther had to revolt uh, and what is the essence of uh, uh, what he believed in and later on all the others the first thing that he opposed of the many these are the three main things is the worship of Mary uh, <coughs> he said that that is not biblical and you cannot keep Mary besides uh, Lord Jesus Christ as uh, a deity or to be worshipped the next big one which is this one sell, selling of ind indulgences and back then um, just to fill the the treasure of the church and the Pope and things like that they came up with uh, uh, a, a method to seek forgiveness so you uh, can actually pay some amount and buy forgiveness and and if you see in the trailer he says that this is just intolerable this is not acceptable and that was rampant during those times and because of which he said this is not going to work and 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 there's a lot out there and this is the this is the third one that he that he revolted against uh, <coughs> um, the mother of uh, uh, Emperor Constantine uh, uh, actually the history says that uh, when Jesus was um, uh, before he was crucified we all know that they put a thorn of uh, um, a crown of thorns on his head they mocked him as the king of Jews and and they dragged him on the streets of Jerusalem and he was taken to Pontius Pilate right the one who was supposed to give the judgment and uh, it is history that there is that belief that Jesus actually had to walk this 28 steps and go and stand before Pilate and uh, when he was walking obviously he was bruised so the blood 
was coming through his body and the, and the blood uh, actually fell on all those steps as he walked up, walked there why i am telling all of this is emperor constantine's mother saint helena they say that actually she exported those 28 steps from jerusalem and she took those and kept it in italy and it is there even now and that is very crucial for catholic faith and and what became as a ritual post then is if you climb those steps on your knees those 28 steps uh, you will receive forgiveness because the blood of jesus has fallen on those steps and again this is what history says i'm not sure i tried my best to get to the core of it i couldn't unfortunately uh, that how did martin luther actually uh, uh, was convicted within himself history says that as he was also walking or kneeling down on those steps and walking up he realized that this is not the right practice and post which he revolted and here it is and <coughs> and he 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 submitted a 95 point thesis and uh, it is there in internet for you and and all those 95 points saying that this is what we are supposed to do as a christian church and and he went about talking about it and obviously he was uh, not accepted he was excommunicated and he nailed that if you've seen in the trailer he was beating that um, he was nailing that paper and those 98 points was nailed on 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 the door of the all saints church in germany and that is how the christian church or the protestant church came into existence and the reformation from then on and unfortunately over these uh, 500 years <coughs> While the church has grown, church has expanded across the globe, there are still a lot of rituals that the Christian church is following. And it is, it is my prayer and it should be our prayer that the church, which is the body of Christ, should come back to the basic word of God. End of the day, heaven and earth will pass away but his word will remain forever. Amen? Th that is crucial. And to understand and to interpret the word for what it is worth is most important. And a lot of people are still struggling to interpret the word of God in the context of how it is written. And, uh, and for which there needs to be effort and I keep telling it many a times, the text is always in the context. It is not just the Bible, any book for that matter. You need to understand the context in which it is written. There are two things in Bible interpretation. I told it multiple times. I don't mind reminding once again. First, to understand the then and the there. That means to whom it was written, why it was written, under which context it was written, that has to be understood after which you apply it for the now and here. That is the fundamental of Bible interpretation. <coughs> so today we will look at, uh, <coughs> after Martin Luther King, uh, there were a couple of others who were instrumental in, in uh, taking this reformation forward. And one great man of God is William Tyndall. And he is the, he is the, he is the first person who translated Bible into English and gave it to England. The Tyndall's Bible, if you get hold of it, uh, any translation Tyndall, I, I, I follow it. it, it it's just amazing. Uh, and uh, he was executed because he went against what others believed in. And if I'm not mistaken, he was in his 40s when he was executed. These are the people who gave Christianity shape. A and now we, we have numerous volumes, courtesy, internet explosion. You, you can get all kinds of versions <laughs> in one Bible app. Uh, you, can, you can get so many commentaries and uh, different translations with, with one Bible software and things like that. But with all of this, what are we doing? 
as the body of Christ. Have you understood your very purpose? Are you living according to his word? And are you making a difference for him wherever you are planted? That is the essence. It is not just to have a knowledge dump, but to understand and implement that very word in our lives. And that is what God expects his children to do. <coughs> Quickly, we will look at six things as we come to the first uh, message in this series of Protestant Reformation. The five fundamentals or principles that they had back then in, in, the, in the language of, in, in, in the Latin language, the first one is God's word alone. Solus Scriptura, which is God's word alone. Why God's word alone? And it is, it is, let us get clarity about this. I spoke about the same uh, theme or, or the principle in the morning service. It is not that the entire truth that mankind is looking for, all kinds of truth are packed in God's word or the Holy Bible. That is not what we are saying. Or all that Jesus has told is condensed in the book which is called the Bible. That is not what we are saying because God's word says that if, if uh, in, in John Gospel, John says that if I have to depend on everything that Jesus did and all that he has said, then the entire books of this world are not sufficient. So <clears throat> uh, that is not what we are seeing. Then, then we say, or when Martin Luther and others came about saying that it is God's word alone, then what are they trying to say? What was that original message that they wanted to give? One word, that God's word is sufficient for all that we need. Just remember this one thing. That is the essence of God's word only or God's word alone. It means that God's word is sufficient for me, is sufficient for my family, is sufficient for my fellowship. It is sufficient for everything that I'm looking for. And if you look at it in that perspective and open that word, you will know, yes, it is sufficient. If you look at one of the most favorite verses when it comes to the word of God. Psalm 19, verse 7, which says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Amazing. This is, there's, I think there's an old Sunday school song on this verse. The law of the Lord or the word of the Lord is what? Perfect. That means there is, there is no, no fault in his word. And, uh, and again, courtesy internet, there is, there is so many debates that happen and, uh, pe and uh, people from other faiths, their whole focus is about the word of God has got some fault in it. It is not complete. There are mistakes. In this translation, it's like this. In this translation, something. For me, this verse settles. And in, in Psalm, Psalm 12, verse 6, if I'm not mistaken. Again, and there are numerous verses. And we'll quickly. Yeah, Psalm, Psalm, 6, Psalm 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. In that previous verse, we said the word of the Lord is, the law of the Lord is perfect. What does it do? Converting the souls. The testimony of the Lord is so powerful that it makes, makes the wise so simple. And here it says, the word of the Lord, uh, the words of the Lord are pure words like silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. That is how pure the word of God is. <clears throat> and when the word of God is spoken, when we receive the word of God, when we read the word of God, when we ponder upon the word of God, when we reflect upon the word of God, one thing happens. Anybody will be enlightened. And let me remind you, word of God is not there to entertain. And nowadays, there is a lot of entertainment in pulpits. 
I have to say it with a lot of heartache. People are trying to be entertainers using this medium, which is so sad. We are not coming here to get entertained. Entertainment is for crowds. There are a lot of entertainments outside. But we are a congregation to be enlightened by the word of God. Hallelujah. That is a basic. That is most important. That is fundamental. And, and why is God's word necessary? It is necessary because only through his word sinners can be saved. If there is anything else, do let me know. Only through the word of God, the pure word of God, the perfect word of God, sinners can be saved. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That is why when the prophet Protestant Reformation came and when Martin Luther wrote those 95 points and when they hit it onto that door and later they summarized and said these are the five important fundamentals that the Christian church should always follow and the first one was God's word alone. God's word alone is sufficient. We don't need anything else. Come back to the, all others. I read a lot of commentaries. I, 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 I read different interpretations and so many other things. But end of the day, you have to come to this. And you should say, Lord, help me understand. These are additional helps, tools. And those are needed to interpret certain verses. Because we, are, we didn't go through that theological training. We didn't go through understanding the Greek language or the Hebrew language and so many other things because that is the original script and which is important. But down there is a lot of tools that are available. But at the end of the day, we should say, Lord, your word matters. And I'll take you at your word. And that should settle everything for us. The word of God is necessary for the salvation of the sinner. Second, for the sanctification of the saint. Not only you and I come to the saving knowledge of, of God because of his word, but after you and I are saved, that very word sanctifies us each day. And that is the importance of the word of God. And that same word directs us to live a life that is victorious. For me, this is what is the word of God. Quickly, we will look at six things with the limited time that we have, of the many that we can see. <clears throat> and I encourage you to go back and meditate upon his word each day. There are two important things in a believer's life. Reading, understanding, and obeying the word of God. And second, being in continuous touch with him, in an attitude of prayer. These are the two basic essentials for any believer of Lord Jesus Christ. His word and being in touch with him through an attitude of prayer. There is nothing else. And there are no other shortcuts. And you need to take that time every day, a special time, one-to-one -one with God. And say, Lord, I am ready to listen to you. And then you go about obeying what he tells you to do. Quickly we look at six things about the power of the word of God. I told this in the morning. That there was a young man who after, many, after he heard about the power of the word of God and, and the transforming power of the word of God that, uh, <clears throat> and, and everything around, uh, around God's word. So he went back, I believe, and started reading the Bible from, from the beginning to the end took a couple of months, read every word, starting to ending. And he came back to the church again. And after the service was over, he met the pastor and he said, a couple of months back I've come and I heard, and you were talking about the word of God and, and, then the, and the power that he has and all of that. So I, I went and read. I went through the Bible, right from the first word to the last. Everything I went through, there was not one person change in me. What are you talking, pastor? Not one person changed. All that you told didn't really work. This pastor who was a mature believer, smiled and he said, I am glad that you went through the Bible, but I am sad that the Bible didn't go through you. Lot of people can 
go through the bible without letting that word go through you yeah and you can block happily you can block and as long as i block when he is speaking to me i will not go through any change as simple as that but when you say god your word and we'll quickly come to it and the first one the, the that the power of the word of god uh, six things i said i'll share the first one is god's word it is not in any particular order but but we will take it as an order the first one is the power the word of god has the power or as we told in the beginning the word of god is sufficient it is sufficient because it has got power to connect hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 another beautiful verse which describes the power of the word of god in one translation it says hebrews chapter 4 verse 12 it's up there for us on the screen in this translation it says for the word of god is living and powerful in another translation it says the word of god is alive and active it is living and powerful or alive and active the word of god has the power to connect what to connect human hearts to the creator that is what the word of god has the word of god has got the power to connect human hearts with the one who created them and 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 this verse tells that it is alive and that means that whenever we open the word of god whenever you start reading the word of god it is always fresh word of god is not stagnant if it was not alive then after one year or two years or three years or four years or five years after you come to know the lord you will be bored reading his word <laughs> but it has been so many years hundreds and thousands of years since the church has been established and and his living word has been given from from the original language now it is available in i don't know in how many languages across this world the word of god is available so freely and and it is the same scripture same 66 books nothing more nothing less and you don't have i don't have nobody else has got authority to add even one word to that precious holy book and and that word that word is so fresh every day when you read it that is what is the amazing life of the word of god i will read martin luther's writing now a small bit he said the word of god is alive it speaks to me of the many things that he said the word of god is alive it speaks to me the word of god has got has got feet it runs with me the word of god has got hands it holds me wow that was word of god for martin luther what is it the word of if somebody can take care of the volunteer if you can just take the boy to the back back room please or or the parents <clears throat> the word of god is alive that means it is fresh and and it is not stagnant and when the word of god is not stagnant your life and my life comes alive when we open it i've been serving the lord for more than 20 years now and over these 20 years i've been sharing so many sermons through that same word and these 20 years each day i keep reading i don't know how many times i completed the entire bible numerous times but then every day when i open his word and read with all honesty i can tell that is so refreshing so refreshing there is something that touches the heart and that is what the power of the word is it has got power to connect so it is not only living as we go back to hebrews 4:12 it is not only living or alive it is active or powerful that means uh, it has got energy another beautiful verse isaiah 55 verse 10 Isaiah 55 verse 10 says if we go to that another beautiful verse for as the rain comes down and the snow from the heaven and do not return there but water the earth and make it bring forth 
and bud that may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater verse 11 so shall see the example like the rain comes down and waters the earth so that the the earth yields fruit rain is just not coming and going back void and god's word says so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth it shall not return to me void or empty but it shall accomplish what i please and it shall prosper in the thing for which i sent it amazing the word that grows out from the mouth of god the word that goes out through your whatsapp message the word that you post on an fb page the word that you take and pray for remember has a purpose hallelujah has a purpose it has got energy it is living it is powerful it is alive it is active that means it has got the power to go and accomplish the purpose that was behind when god gave that word originally wow you should have that faith and when you are forwarding a verse or a small devotion or you are touched by a by, by a passage and you say oh this i need to post it in our group because this is what god spoke to me or it just appealed to me a beautiful promise or a caution when you're posting it utter this small prayer and say lord your word says that it has got the power to accomplish it will not come back void i am sending it to this group and i want that power to come into operation and leave the rest to him the power to connect human hearts God's word is sufficient. Why? Because it has got power to connect human hearts. Second, it has got power to convict human hearts. Not only to connect, but convict. That same verse that we saw before, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, I stopped at the beginning. The second part of that verse, we saw that first part. For the word of God is living and powerful, and then and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's even more sharper than a two-edged sword. One-edged sword is itself dangerous for me. <laughs> right? Uh, imagine it two-edged sword and which is much sharper <laughs> think about it that is the reason it says that the word of God has has got the power to convict any human imagination irrespective of however intelligent the person claims to be that the person says I've got this wealth of knowledge and there are so many testimonies of atheists who were outrightly denying the existence of God, finally read the word of God and were convicted. And there are so many testimonies of atheists who started to follow Christ, who said, we realized, finally, yes, Jesus is a living God. Amazing. There are still some people who oppose. There are a lot of people. But then, they are not letting that word go through their life. And I can, I can, I can, I can tell it with complete conviction that anybody who is open to let God's word go through their heart is bound to change. He is bound to change. There is no two ways. Apostle Paul is the greatest example. <laughs> the one who opposed Christianity. The one who had this authority from the government to eradicate the name of Christianity from the very face of this world was on that road to Damascus we know what happened one encounter with the living God and he changed and after after Christ history says that Apostle Paul was responsible to give shape for Christianity amazing the power of the Word of God and and uh, <clears throat> after uh, in the book of Acts in this early um, early stages after the disciples were in that upper room and 
God the Holy Spirit came and each one of them were, were filled by, by the Holy Spirit and, and they got courage and that is when Peter stood up and he gave the first sermon. Acts chapter 2 verse 31, verse 37. Acts chapter 2 verse, verse 37 if we can pull up. And, uh, and as they heard, now when they heard this, it's a long sermon that Peter preached with the power of the Holy Spirit. They were cut to hearts. We just saw that to us in Hebrews 4.12. We don't have to see that. It says, the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. Now when they heard the word of God, they were cut, where? To the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter says, go get baptized. That is the power of the word of God. Power to convict. And next, it has got the power to convert. And that is what we saw in the, in the beginning, Psalm 19, 7. The, word of the, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Converting the soul. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. It has got the power to convert. And if you go back to Acts chapter 2, after that message and after this question, uh, when, when they were cut in their hearts and, and the people out there who were listening who said, Peter and other apostles, what do you want us to do? And Peter gives the answer. And, and in verse, verse 41 of, of, of the second chapter, verse 41, he says, Then those who gladly received his word, please underline, which word? The word of God. Through Peter. When Peter preached the word of God, all these people who are listening allowed that word to work in their lives and they were cut within their hearts and they said, what are we supposed to do? And he said, go get baptized in the name of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. And he says, then those who gladly received his word were baptized and there were 3,000 people on a single day. One single day, the first message. And that's how the early church began. By receiving the word of God in the book of Acts, constantly you will hear this, that the word of God was preached, the word of God was preached, the word of God was preached. That's all. Now there is less of word of God, more of stories in preaching, unfortunately. And uh, it's nice. In one hour message, 45 minutes, beautiful stories. It will be very entertaining. I said, wow. Next Sunday again. So you come to get entertained and you go back without any change. But when the pure word of God is given and when you let that word operate in your life and when you obey his word, you are bound to change, I am bound to change. And we will allow God to set things right in our lives <coughs> as long as we are willing to obey. That is the third one. Fourth one, the word of God has got the power to conform us into the image of God. That is the work of the word of God. Jesus prayed this high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. He prayed for his disciples and then all those who expressed their faith in him. A beautiful prayer. And in John 17, 17, this is what he says. He says, sanctify them in the truth, for your word is truth. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. His word is pure. His word is perfect. His word is living. His word is powerful. His word is a two-edged sword. And his word is truth. Heaven and earth will pass away. But his word will remain forever. Faith comes from hearing hearing the word of God. That is why this word of God is sufficient. And it, it, it confirms us. The work of the word of God is to continue to sanctify us. And in, in 1 Peter, uh, second chapter, second verse, it says, like newborn babes long for the pure milk of word so that, it, it, so that by it you may grow in respect of salvation. And, and as you slowly grow, and as you allow his word to operate in your life, 
we continue to become like him. Like when a newborn enters a family, you know, initially that day one, day two, there are a lot of comments that, that we hear. Each one will decide at day one whom they are looking like. Knowing pretty much after one, two months or three months, things are going to change uh, as, as the complexion changes. Every time when, 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 when children are born, they, are, they seem to be very fair, right? <laughs> and and a, as the months go by, a lot of things happen. But finally, you know, at, at some stage, maybe, maybe during their teens or something, and they, they say, yeah, initially that we thought that this boy looks like his mother. Now it's more like dad. Now it's more like mama or atta and so on and so forth. Right? But there are some qualities. But when you look at the smile of their son or, or the way he or she walked, exactly like their dad, exactly like their mom. Right? Because you are born in that family. Those, th those genes are in you and me. As simple as that. Now when, when my dad's sister or somebody or related to him, they come and they see me after so many years. They tell me now that we don't have to see you. If we just close our eyes and listen to your voice, it's exactly like our brother spoke when he was young like you. But for me, I, I think there's a lot of difference between me and my dad. My mom, my mom is not alive for me to check. But they say that now there are so many mannerisms that the way you use your hands and all of that, there are so many mannerisms that are exactly like our brother. I didn't imitate. I never watched my dad as much because I was always from home. I was that rebel, I was that prodigal son. But because I was born in that family, I think as I matured, those, those qualities probably came. And if that is in this physical realm, the same is in the spiritual realm. And not just when you are born, you don't become like your dad or mom. But as you grow in that family, you tend to become like them. And as you grow in the family of God, and as you desire this milk as a newborn babe, and as you grow as a mature believer, this very word will become meat for you. And for me, you and I will become like him. That is the power of the word of God to conform you into the image of the one who created you and me. Wow. The fifth one. The word of God has got the power to counsel. Power to counsel. It has not only got the power to connect human hearts, to convict, to convert, but to counsel. To counsel, you and me. To conform and to counsel. The greatest counsel you and I can receive is when we open the word of God. The lengthiest chapter in the Bible is Psalm 119, right? And, and, and a lot of Psalm 119 is about the Word of God. Many verses within Psalm 9, 119 is about the Word of God. We'll quickly read from 98 to 100 and then we'll go to the last one and with that we close. Psalm 119 verses 98 to 100, please. You through your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. What is ever with me? The word of God is ever with me. For I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts or your word. And there are so many other verses. God's word is sufficient. And for any question that you have, any concern that you have, any situation that you face, you just have to go back to his word and say, Lord, I need help. I need wisdom. I need guidance. And I am reading your word. Help me, God. It has got the power to counsel. Last one. It has got power to conquer. Power to conquer. Ephesians 6, 
17 put on the armor of God and in that it says that <coughs> Ephesians 6 17 and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God which is the word of God you and I are fighting not flesh and blood but demonic forces and this battle is on till the time Jesus comes or our life is getting to get or our life gets over there is no truce or as they say there is no peace and we need to fight this battle and the weapon that we have is the word of God and take on that word of God and go about fighting the battle and claim his word God's word alone is sufficient and it has got the power to connect to convert to convict to conform to counsel and to conquer and there's so much more that you can understand and this word is alive and active and remember God has given his word because he had purpose behind and whenever you read his word and say Lord help me to follow always and always wait on him to say Lord what was the purpose behind giving me this word today as I read my daily portion as somebody sent a whatsapp message in, in which there came a verse or I read when I was walking down uh, to my office or something else whenever the word of God comes before you irrespective of through whatever medium take a moment ponder upon it and say Lord your word just, just doesn't come like that it doesn't because it has got a purpose behind and that has to be accomplished if this has come to me today in this form what are you telling me God till you get to it hold on to that thought and you will see the power of God operate in your life let us pray as we thank God for his precious word pure word perfect word alive and active it gives us such a joy that we have abundant word in this country we have got the freedom to read his word we have got freedom to proclaim his word above everything we need to make the choice to follow and do according to his word say Lord thank you for your word and helping us understand the power that your word has and let us take a commitment that we will allow his word to operate in our lives gracious God we praise your holy name thank you O master for giving us your very word today as you always do may we always hold on to this beautiful precious powerful word each day of our lives we don't need any other supplements of God accepting your word in Jesus name I pray Amen